Today we are joined by today we're joined by our colleagues at HUD and uh, HHS to talk about coordinating housing related supports and services with HUD housing assistance for people experiencing homelessness. Next slide, please. Great, and here's information about the webinar logistics. So this session is being recorded and the recording will be shared at this following link. Throughout the webinar, we'll be um, including uh, links, webinar, um, website links in the Q&A or comments section so that you have those available immediately. Um, but the slides, as I said, will be available to you at a later date. Um, all participants are muted, so don't worry about whether you need to mute yourself. And if you're having any trouble connecting your computer audio, you can call in using the following information. Please submit questions in the Q&A box and we will get to those throughout the webinar. We do have a section at the end of the webinar um, that um, will be uh, sort of available just for Q&A, though feel free to ask throughout the, the session um, and we'll get to those that we can as we're going through. Next slide, please. So today we'll be doing, um, we're going to have a welcome from David Gonzalez Rice, who's the Special Assistant for Housing and Services at the Office of the Secretary of HUD. Then the Technical Assistance Collaborative, myself, will be providing some context to this topic. And then we'll welcome our guests from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So with that, I would like to go ahead and welcome and introduce David Gonzalez Rice um, with the Office of the Secretary at HUD. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, on behalf of Secretary Fudge, I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you for your participation and your interest this afternoon. Uh, we're very excited at HUD to hear from our colleagues at CMS about resources that can assist people experiencing and exiting homelessness. Um, we know the American Rescue Plan made really significant investments to address homelessness. Uh, and we've heard from a lot of communities around the country that are really excited about those housing resources. Uh, we often also hear that those communities feel like the resources aren't necessarily there to go with the housing. Uh, but in fact, there are lots of services dollars uh, in the American Rescue Plan. Uh, they might not have come through as a COC grant or have homelessness in the, in the name of that budget line. Uh, but there's a lot of services dollars to be found there. And the uh, rescue plans investments in FMAP uh, and uh, uh, some of the resources we'll be hearing about today uh, are just some of them. Uh, so Medicaid and FMAP, they do come with some logistical things to work out, but the potential scale here uh, is really game-changing and significant. So we just want to uh, encourage you heading out from today uh, if you don't know your Medicaid director, your state Medicaid director, get to know them, make that introduction, make sure they know about the significant opportunity that we all have uh, and what a difference these service dollars can do to reach Medicaid beneficiaries who are experiencing homelessness or exiting homelessness uh, and um, to make a difference on the impact on healthcare systems and Medicaid costs around the country. Uh, so thanks again to everyone. Thanks to uh, our presenters and uh, look forward to hearing from Great, thank you so much, David. Next slide, please. Okay, so just wanted to make sure that um, everyone has um, context for the purpose and the agenda for today. So attendees will be equipped to identify available housing related supports, which we'll define in a moment and services in their state and communities, attendees will also be able to locate their state and local agencies responsible for funding and delivering these resources in order to reach out and form partnerships to ensure successful referrals, lease up and ongoing tenancy and HUD housing programs, especially the housing emergency housing voucher program. And this web webinar will also be helpful for PHAs, public housing authorities, with a homeless admission preference and PHAs with a special purpose voucher program such as Mainstream, Family Unification Program, and HUD VASH. So the agenda will be defining housing related supports and services and how these can be paired with HUD housing assistance to benefit individuals experiencing homelessness. 
will describe resources available through federal health and human service agencies, specifically the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services today that can fund housing related supports and services, including the new resources in the American Rescue Plan. We'll offer a couple of examples of on the ground partnerships and pairing of HUD HHS resources and takeaways for public housing authorities and continuums of care and others to learn more and pursue partnership opportunities. And then we'll take some questions and provide answers. Next slide, please. Okay, so we do want to just remind folks that um, this webinar is the second in a three part series identifying health and human service agency resources that can be used for housing support services, along with specific partnership opportunities and on the ground examples of successful approaches to pairing these resources. Next slide, please. So we wanted to just pause for a moment and do a quick poll. Um, and Ari is going to bring up our poll today. This will just give us a better sense of who's listening in so that um, our, our presenters have um, a little bit more context as to who's joining today's call. So folks can list, uh, select who you're associated with, a single choice. Um, we'll just let this sit up here for a second and then we'll look at the results. All right, so it looks like about 24% are with public housing agencies, 28% are with continuums of care, 3% with victim services, and then 45% with others. Um, so we uh, would love, you know, if you have a moment in um, the Q&A to just um, type in the other type of um, agency that you're affiliated with. And we'll take a look at that at the end. Great. Okay, next slide, please. So now we just wanna make sure that we're all sort of on the same page in terms of the language that we're using here when we're talking about housing related supports and services. So these are really sort of um, comprised of four different types of, of services. Um, the first of which is outreach and engagement referral services. So these are services that help identify and refer people experiencing homelessness to coordinated entry, to access housing assistance provided by the COCs and public housing authorities. Then there are pre-tenancy services. So these are services that assist people with housing access, such as housing search assistance, landlord engagement and housing navigation, security deposits, uh, supporting uh, uh, prospective tenants with their rent and utility arrears, helping obtain documentation to verify eligibility, move-in assistance and home furnishings. And then housing stabilization services and service coordination are those that help people stabilize in housing and connect them with community-based services and then finally, this last category um, would uh, be ongoing tenancy sustaining supports and wraparound services. So these might be services that are offered to people in permanent supportive housing and assist people in being successful tenants, uh, such as ongoing individualized case management, help maintaining one's home with activities of daily living and with preventing lease violations and care coordination with health and behavioral health systems. Next slide. So at this slide, um, we have a couple of slides here. We really want to lay out um, the types of uh, housing related supports and services by population. And so these are just some examples. We, you can see on the left column, we have population. So if we're looking at, for example, individuals with disabling conditions, you can see the associated needs that they might have, which would be the need for permanent supportive housing, the need for primary and behavioral health care, benefits and entitlement supports, and employment and education supports, 
And the third column to the, um, from the left, care coordination partners, um, these would be different partners that it would be important for um, housing uh, navigators or housing case managers to coordinate with. Um, so street outreach workers, community health centers, behavioral health agencies, supported employment providers, community corrections. And then to the far right column, intensity of services, um, this, the, in, the population of individuals who have disabling conditions may need um, crisis response capability that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week in order to sort of um, uh, de-escalate uh, a critical incident and hopefully uh, avoid unnecessary hospitalizations or encounters with the emergency services, um, as well as ongoing intensive engagement, tenancy supports and wraparound services. And then if you follow the families column and row, you'll see sort of the assumptions that are made based on family populations. So in addition to um, uh, primary and behavioral health care benefits and entitlements, um, likely families may need rental assistance and housing location supports rather than permanent support of housing. Um, but you'll see that the care coordination partners also include landlords, um, child welfare, schools, victim services, in addition to some of the others laid out above. All right, next slide, please. And then here we've laid out for youth, um, similar, you know, the, the same sort of categories of associated needs, care coordination partners, and intensity of services. Really important for youth to be coordinating with school and education programs, family engagement services, post homes or foster care, juvenile justice or adult corrections, as well as victim service providers, in addition to the others that we've identified. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so this slide, um, we really wanted to um, reference the HUD housing opportunities. So, you know, as we heard at the beginning of the session, um, and, and many of you have heard uh, for several months now that the emergency housing voucher program is available through the American Rescue Plan, uh, providing 70,000 housing choice vouchers to local public housing authorities in order to assist the following groups of individuals and families. And I'll let you all take a look at those, that list of four. And public housing authorities, as you probably well know, are required to partner with continuums of care or other homeless or victim service providers to assist qualifying families through a direct referral process. And MOUs between public housing authorities and continuums of care and other partners were due on July 31st um, and were to identify a service services provided to assist emergency housing voucher applicants and participants, including what is being offered to ensure that referrals are successful. Okay. Just taking a brief moment to look at any questions uh, that may be um, queued up for now. Alicia, I'm just going to pause for a second to see if we have any that need to be answered now or if we're good to continue going. You are good to continue going. Great, thank you. Okay, so this slide um, lays out um, other HUD housing programs uh, by program office um, and you know, these are broader, a uh, broader range of HUD housing assistance options beyond just the emergency housing vouchers that can be paired with HHS opportunities for funding and delivering housing support services to people experiencing homelessness. So you'll see here that under the special needs assistance program, there's the continuum of care program. Um, we know that about a quarter of today's audience are associated with continuums of care. And then there's the Emergency Solutions Grant Rapid Rehousing Program. 
And then in public and Indian housing, we know that housing choice vouchers, special, special purpose vouchers such as VASH, which is the Veterans um, Housing Voucher Program, uh, emergency housing vouchers, mainstream for people with disabilities and public housing is also an available resource for housing. And then in the Office of Multifamily, there's the Section 811 PRA program for people with disabilities. There is Section 811 for people with disabilities and Section 202, serving elderly populations. So it's important to think um, about the opportunities that will be shared today by our colleagues from CMS that are beyond just the emergency housing voucher program um, and to determine if there are other available um, resources that are coming into our community from these HUD programs. It could be paired with um, the Medicaid uh, related resources that we're going to talk about next. So with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Jennifer Bodoin, Jean Close, and Martha Egan. Their titles are all here on the slide, and they are with the Centers for Medicaid and CHIP Services, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you all. Hi there, it's uh, Jean Close. Thank you so much for including us in today's um, uh, webinar. We're really looking forward to introducing you to, to Medicaid. I love the program. And uh, during the next 10 minutes, I'd like to introduce you to, to Medicaid and hope that you will reach out to your state Medicaid agency and other partners that you meet in this series so that you can develop and strengthen a collaborative relationship for the benefit of the individuals that we hold in common. So let's get started with five things you, that you've always wanted to know about Medicaid. All right. First, did you know that Section 1902 of the Social Security Act established medical assistance? The provisions in this and Section 1902 form the basis of our crazy quilt of Medicaid programs across the country. Medicaid is indeed a state and federal partnership. That is, states establish their programs within state and federal parameters. There's a wide range of service delivery structures through which straight states provide medical assistance. For example, Connecticut furnishes services through a fee-for-service system, while Arizona operates their whole Medicaid program through a Section 1115 demonstration. Many states serve individuals through a mix, through both fee-for-service and managed care plans. States are reimbursed from the federal government at a federal medical assistance percentage or FMAP rate. States must share in the cost of furnishing coverage. The amount of federal share varies from 50% to about 87% federal share for some states. This rate can also vary by service and by eligibility group too, but more about FMAP later. On to the second thing that you've wanted to, always wanted to know about Medicaid. Uh, each state has a state plan. State plan is a huge document that reflects all aspects of a state's unique program. Almost all state plans are on the web. And as you wonder about what Medicaid can do for your constituents, this document is a wealth of information. Medicaid.gov also provides a high level um, source of information about uh, each state. Now, if a state wants to make changes in their payment methodologies, their eligibility or services, a state submits a state plan amendment or a SPA. We have funny language in Medicaid. I'm sure you don't in your system. They submit the SPA to CMS for review and approval. The state decides who is served, the services available, including the amount, the duration and scope of these services. The state decides on the service delivery system and whether the program is operated through managed care plans or on a fee-for-service basis or a mix of service delivery systems. We discussed the Medicaid state plan a little bit earlier, but the states are constantly amending the plans. And some amendments 
require states to receive their own legislative authority. So recall that Medicaid is, is a state and federal partnership. Medicaid expenditures are a significant part of state budgets and an entitlement. So many states tread carefully and deliberately in deciding whether to expand services or eligibility because of the very real cost implications to the state. I mentioned earlier that a state's Medicaid program is described in the plan. Um, the program also must uh, meet rules in the Code of Federal Regulations or CFR. Further, the program is guided by policies reflected in state Medicaid director's letters or state health official letters. And these can be found on Medicaid.gov. This is a, just a great resource. Um, the program's constantly changing. So uh, staying informed with these new um, uh, uh, through state Medicaid director's letters or show letters uh, can be very, um, very helpful. So on to the third thing that you've always wanted to know about Medicaid. And these are some of the basic statutory requirements. They kind of make you scratch your head when you see the differences um, in states programs, but there is a foundation um, within uh, 1902 and other places within the statute. And here's, here's some of the, the, the most important, in my opinion. Uh, the statute requires that each service must be sufficient in duration, amount, and scope. The statute, statute requires that services are available statewide throughout the state to the extent feasible. The statute, statute also requires that services are equal in amount, duration, and scope for any individual within an eligibility group. Also, individuals must have a choice of qualified provider. Choice of qualified provider and any willing and qualified provider must be allowed to participate in Medicaid. Now, these uh, I mentioned that these are foundational provisions, but these provisions can be waived when consistent with access, quality, and the efficient and economic provision of the services. Sometimes services have waivers built into the service, such as targeted case management services, which allows a services, service to be limited geographically um, or to certain uh, groups or to certain providers for certain po populations. But more about waivers later. To talk briefly about Medicaid eligibility. And really you could spend a whole week talking about each of these, these topics easily. But this will, hopefully uh, this presentation will give you a bit of the language that is used in Medicaid and may um, feel you, a bit, you may feel a bit more comfortable about um, working with your partners in Medicaid. So anyway, the, the fourth fact that you've always wanted to know about Medicaid, to be eligible, individuals must fit into a group. Some are mandatory, such as children under age 19, but others are optional, such as the medically needy group. Individuals also must meet income standards. Now, looking at this slide, you can probably recognize many of your constituents here. I believe there's, there, there may be over 60 Medicaid eligibility groups. So um, your constituents will probably fit in somewhere. But again, this could vary with, for the optional groups, this will vary by state. Now, here's my, my favorite aspect of uh, Medicaid that you may have always wanted to know about. And Ra Rachel and her colleagues um, uh, have discussed some of these, but I'd like to connect the dots a, a bit between what is really helpful uh, to individuals um, needing housing supports and connect the dots with the, what is covered under Medicaid and the language, again, that we use in, in Medicaid for these benefits. Uh, this list, and I realize it's it's very it's microscopic probably for you to to review, um, but I'd I'd like to draw your attention to 1905 of the Secu Social Security Act that does um, define these services. Also at 1915, so those are the official definitions of, of the services. Also, um, not too long ago, we put out a state health official letter, a show um, that uh, talks about the social determinants of health and Medicaid and how Medicaid covers these. And this is a, a really nice and user-friendly um, uh, description of, of many bit of benefits, and, and especially in relationship to housing um, uh, services and support. So definitely invite you to take a look at, at that document. And it will, will 
mention it again on one of the last slides we have here today. But I, I do want to delve into a few of these that may be a special interest to you. Uh, on the left-hand column are um, mandatory services that all states offer. It's a, quite a broad benefit, um, but this probably looks a good bit like the kinds of services you, that we all have in, in um, our uh, health insurance plans. Um, but a, a special note is EPSDT. We're constantly talking in acronyms here, but this stands for Early and Periodic Screening Diagnostic and Treatment Services. And this is Medicaid's benefit for children. So children must be have available all the services listed on 19, in 1905A of the Act, whether they're mandatory or whether they're optional. It's a comprehensive and a critical benefit. Yet I understand that only 16, 60%, at 60% of children who would qualify for Medicaid are enrolled. So you can help us out. Get children enrolled in Medicaid. Uh, other mandatory services include federally qualified health centers. Many of you are probably very familiar with FQHCs and also rural health centers that offer a similar, a similar array of comprehensive services in, the, in communities. Later on today, you're gonna to be hearing more from uh, Washington State, uh, who's doing some very cool activities with FQHCs. It's a mandatory service. Home health services is also mandatory, it includes the services of nurses, home health aides, as well as medical equipment. And of course, these are provided in the home um, and optional uh, under that benefit are therapies. Transportation to medical appointments is also a mandatory service. On to home and community-based services. Now these fall in, the, in the, the category of optional Medicaid services, except for the ones that um, I just featured a couple minutes ago. Um, but I'd like to um, spend a, just a bit of time on this. Um, I'm going to, again, this is going to be a very high level discussion, and it would be great if you would invite us back in some other venue to uh, talk in great depth about, about these services. But just to give you a, a, a flavor and also to help demystify some of these, um, these numbers and letters uh, on this slide uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to refer you back again to this state, the um, social determinants of health, state health officials letter as well. Um, personal care services is widely used um, uh, within our home and community-based services uh, venues, and it's human assistance to help individuals to accomplish the activities of daily li living or instrumental activities of daily limit living. Rehabilitative services is another category offered through, through the state plan that reduces physical and mental disability and restores beneficiaries to the best, the person's best possible functional level. Examples include counseling for individuals with mental health or substance use disorders, as well as the therapies, physical, occupational, and speech therapies. Crisis services are also covered under this, this category. A, um, a premier service is that you'll hear a lot about, and you, you probably know a lot about already for those working in continues, continuums of care, uh, is the Section 1915C Home and Community-Based Services or waiver programs, waiver programs. This 1915C serves individuals who meet, meet the state's institutional level of care. And that means that the individual could be admitted to a nursing facility, a hospital, or an intermediate care facility for individuals with intellectual disorders, uh, disabilities. States uh, can target programs to specific populations and limit services geographically under 1915C waiver programs. The services include case management, home accessibility adaptations, one-time community transition cert costs, housing and tenancy supports, habilitation services, non-medical transportation, home delivered meals, supportive employment, and assisted technologies, as well as other types of services that may assist in diverting individuals from institutional placement and supporting community living for eligible individuals. So this is really a, a, a tremendous important program uh, to delve into and to find out how your state is providing this service. The, um, the, the sister uh, service of 1915C waiver programs is the state plan home and community-based service, or 1915I, 
and it includes all the services I just mentioned, or the, the potential for including all of the services that I just mentioned. However, the eligibility uh, for the participants differs. I mentioned that for 1915C, individuals need to have an, ins an institutional level of care. For 1915I, that is not the case. The individuals must meet, meet needs-based criteria, and these criteria are less stringent than the institutional level of care. Uh, the needs-based criteria are factors that are based on an individual evaluation of need and may include, but cannot only include, um, state-defined risk factors such as risk of or experiencing homelessness, risk of food insecurity, or risk of social isolation for older adults with chronic conditions. Um, another um, uh, option that's available is self-directed personal assistance services, or 1915J, and it permits individuals to self-direct their own services, their own personal assistance services under the state plan or under waiver programs. More, more numbers and letters, 1915K is also known as Community First Choice, which also provides community and home-based uh, home attended services and supports. One of my favorite um, uh, programs is uh, PACE, the Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. It provides everything a person needs, um, comprehensive medical and social services. It's based in an adult day health center, as well as in, uh, provides in-home and referral services according to a participant's needs. And I'm gonna finish up with uh, section 1115 demonstrations, which isn't really a service in itself. Um, you're gonna be hear hearing from Washington and Maryland today about their innovative, the innovative approaches that they're implementing through 1915, through 1115 demonstrations uh, that cover housing related services and supports. But basically section 1115 demonstrations waive certain provisions of section 1902. So I'm continuing to circle back to good old section 1902. Um, it can waive these provisions if for the benefit of the Medicaid program. So these demonstrations must not cost the government more than the state's historical uh, Medicaid program, but the demonstrations allow for innovative service delivery models and reimbursement for costs that are not ordinarily covered under Medicaid. So with that, I'd like to turn the agenda over to uh, Martha Egan, who is our technical director. And Martha is gonna talk about section 19, uh, 9817 which provides enhanced reimbursement for home and community-based services to states. Martha. Great, thanks, thanks, Jean. And, and it looks like we are on the right slide here. So um, we're gonna stick on this slide. We're gonna stay with this slide for, for quite some time. So, um, so I'm gonna provide a, a couple of updates on recent uh, federal activity and funding related to home and community-based services. And as Jean just mentioned, these are the types of services that can support individuals who need you know, long-term services and supports to live independently in homes and communities of their choice. Um, and HCBS services can include housing-related services and supports. Um, and again, that would be under certain Medicaid authorities and for certain populations. But the one caveat or disclaimer that we always have to kind of um, bring up when we're talking about housing and Medicaid is that Medicaid does not pay for a room and board. Um, except in certain medical institutions like a skilled nursing facility. But what this you know, means simply is that Medicaid does not cover such things as ongoing rental assistance or ongoing utility payments and the like. And that's kind of you know, why we are here today is that you know, Medicaid can provide, as Jean just described, this broad array of services and supports to help individuals live in the community. And, uh, and HUD and their resources can provide accessible, affordable housing for, for individuals. So I wanna kind of start with kind of briefly going over what do we mean by housing related supports under the Medi Medicaid program. Um, and Rachel did talk a lot about these, um, but, uh, but under Medicaid, um, it, it generally includes a, a few concepts or a few, or a few types of services and supports. Um, and I'm gonna start with um, the one-time moving costs. So, Medicaid can cover, and again, this would be under certain Medicaid authorities, they can cover one-time moving costs, such as a security deposit, um, payment for basic household furnishings, 
Uh, Medicaid can cover a one-time cost or cost for transportation expenses that might be related to a move when necessary, and also that would be unavailable through other resources. And of course, it would have to be identified in what we refer to as a person-centered um, service plan. Um, Medicaid can also provide pre-tenancy supports under certain Medicaid authorities, and these can include activities such as assisting with the housing search, training on how to search for housing, um, completing or assisting an individual with completing the application for housing assistance, um, reviewing and signing a lease or rental agreement. So the, and that's just an example of a couple of the uh, tenant types of pre-tenancy supports. Medicaid can also cover under certain authorities, tenancy supports or housing sustain, sustaining supports. And those can be activities that can help an individual to maintain their tenancy, which can include um, education and training on the role, rights, and responsibilities of the tenant and landlord, and also connecting an individual to community resources to maintain housing, housing stability. Uh, Medicaid can also cover home accessibility supports, which can include things like installing grab bars and wheel, wheelchair accessible ramps. And finally, um, real, Medicaid can really be a very critical and integral part of a collaboration with other community-based programs, including state and local housing agencies, public housing authorities, and continuums of care. And Medicaid can cover these, um, can cover certain housing-related supports for individuals who are transitioning from institutional settings, such as a nursing facility, and from non-institutional congregate settings, which could include homeless shelters, to more integrated community-based set settings. And again, Medicaid can also cover a broad range of supports and services well beyond you know, housing-related supports to help Medicaid beneficiaries to achieve community living goals and community integration goals. So what I'm going to do now is talk about what we see here on the slide, and that's two current home and community-based HCBS initiatives under the Medicaid program that really can provide some new opportunities for state Medicaid agencies to collaborate and partner with housing entities and housing resources to help Medicaid beneficiaries transition into affordable and accessible housing and also gain access to the supports and services that an individual may need to live independently in the community. And the first initiative that you see up here is Section 9817 of the American Rescue Plan Act. And what Section 9817 does, it temporarily increases the federal ma matching assistance percentage rate, or what we refer to as the FMAP, um, for, quali for qualified states by 10 percentage points for Medicaid home and community-based services for a temporary one-year period between April 1st, 2021 and March 31st, 2022. And to receive this increased FMAP, states have to um, meet two objectives or two commitments. And one of them is that they, they must supplement and not supplant the level of state funds um, expended for HCBS. And secondly, they must implement or supplement the implementation of activities to enhance, expand, or strengthen HCBS, their, their HCBS systems. And a 10 percentage point increase in the state's FMAP on HCB, HCBS services for a one-year period um, can really amount to some um, significant funding for states to apply or fund uh, various kinds of activities to really strengthen their HCBS systems. And states have a three-year period up until March 31st, 2024, um, to expend the funds to, to plan for and, and implement um, these activities. So what are states doing right now? So right now around section 9817, so states right now really are very busy sort of um, planning initiatives, activities, and programs that are designed to expand, enhance, and strengthen their HCBS systems. And some of these state initiatives um, are including or do include developing partnerships between health and housing entities and providing supports and services for individuals transitioning into affordable housing. And several states um, are targeting their activities or some of their programs um, under Section uh, 9817 
to individuals who are experiencing homelessness or perhaps may be at risk for experiencing homelessness for these programs. And examples of some of the initiatives that we're seeing from states are things like providing, providing these housing related supports and services um, for individuals who are experiencing homelessness or are at risk of experiencing homelessness. And some states are doing this, for example, under a pilot program. They may be testing or targeting certain geographical areas um, or, or testing and targeting certain service, services um, under a pilot sort of framework. And other states are going to be actually um, doing this or providing housing, housing related supports under the regular Medicaid program um, for certain populations, um, such as individuals with a mental health and or substance use disorder um, who are experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Uh, some states are working on activities to provide intensive case management and outreach services to individuals experiencing homelessness. And some states are looking at funding sort of um, multidisciplinary behavioral health teams. And um, these teams are being assembled to assist individuals who are experiencing homelessness across um, medical and social supports, and which could include linking individuals to affordable housing. And some states are looking at ways to enhance and expand home accessibility options for individuals with a disability and, and older adults by providing flexible funding for home modifications, home repairs, and assistive technology to help individuals remain at home. So section 9817 offers lots of opportunities and flexibilities for states to partner and collaborate, and collaborate across the health and housing systems really to provide access to affordable and accessible housing and access to supported services for individuals who are experiencing or are at risk of experiencing homelessness. Um, or also for individuals who are transitioning from institutional settings. So that's kind of 9817 um, in, a, in a bit of a nutshell. And now we're going to move on and talk a little bit about um, the Money Follows a Person program or the Money Follows a Person demonstration program. And this is a longstanding federally funded grant program to support states with rebalancing their long-term care services and support system and to provide Medicaid beneficiaries who live in institutions or reside in institutions the opportunity to transition to the community. And when we say rebalancing, what, we're really, what we really mean is sort of shifting this institutional bias towards home and community-based services. And the MFP program started back in 2008. And since that time, states have transitioned well over 100,000 individ individuals to the community um, under the MFP demonstration. And right now there are 33 states and DC who are currently participating in the program. But over the last couple of years, MF MFP has kind of been operating under, under a series of sort of short-term extensions but, that, but towards the end of last year, I think in December of 2020, Congress did extend the MFP program through federal fiscal year 2023, um, which actually will allow states to continue to operate their, um, their programs for several more years, I think up and through, up through 2027. So um, the, the, the extension of the MFP program under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, um, not only extended MFP, but it also is going to allow new states to join or apply for the demonstration. So, you know, given this more sort of solid funding for the MFP demonstration, we really expect to see states to continue all the work that they've been doing around expanding and enhancing their, their housing services and supports and their housing infrastructure um, and all of their housing related activities that they've been doing under the demonstration to help individuals transition from institutional settings into the community. And under the MFP demonstration, states have developed and implemented a lot of very innovative strategies to provide housing related supports. And for example, MFP um, programs do provide pre-tenancy supports. Several of the programs are actually, uh, almost all of them do. Um, and that has included things like funding dedicated positions for housing coordinators or housing navigators to assist individuals with applying for federally assisted housing programs, to conduct housing searches, to provide a robust package of community transi transition services that include things like security deposits, first month's rents, 
purchasing of necessary um, household goods. MFP programs have also funded tenancy supports to help individuals meet the obligations of their tenancy or their lease. And this has included things like employing or funding case managers with specialized housing knowledge, peer supports, um, and, and more specialized transition coordinators to help support individuals to achieve community living goals. Uh, MFP programs have also um, funded lots of innovative approaches around home accessibility, including not only funding home modifications, but also pursuing things like landlord outreach and engagement efforts to identify accessible housing units and landlord incentives around making units more accessible. MFP programs have also hired housing specialists to develop, strengthen, and sustain partnerships between state Medicaid agencies and state and local housing providers. And additionally, MFP programs have implemented a lot of activities that expand and enhance HCBS systems. Um, and some examples of those system level um, activities include things like developing web-based housing registries and referral systems, providing training on housing related processes and programs for MFP housing coordinators and transition coordination staff. Um, and that has included training on the housing choice voucher program process. Um, and again, I just wanna emphasize that the MFP program has really has lots of flexibility to implement very creative and innovative approaches to support individuals with locating, securing, and man maintaining affordable and accessible housing. And one more thing with um, about MFP, back in September of 2020, um, grantee, the MFP grantees, the current grantees, they were offered a $5 million supplemental funding opportunity for um, HCBS Home and Community-Based Service Capacity Building and one area that this um, particular um, funding opportunity can support is developing and maintaining and strengthening these um, partnerships, uh, Medicaid housing partnerships um, that will directly impact MFP participants, but also can be extended to support a broader HCBS populations, and including populations that may be at risk of institutionalization, which certainly could include individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So MFP like 9817 offers lots of opportunities for states to collaborate across health and housing systems. But one really very unique strength about the MFP program um, is that the programs generally target multiple populations to include individuals with a physical disability, individuals with an intellectual disability, older adults, individuals with a mental health and or a substance use disorder, individuals with chronic illnesses. So the programs, the MFP programs are really working across the Medicaid, what we would sometimes refer to as the Medicaid operational system. Um, the different, um, um, the different um, service systems that serve these various populations. So they, they can play, right? the MFP program can really play a critical role in relationship building and making connections across these systems. So we certainly encourage you to, to reach out to your MFP demonstration programs. So um, let's go on to the next slide. Great, thanks. So, um, so the next slide is just a, a, a list of uh, resources that are available to you on medicaid.gov. And I'm gonna highlight a few of them um, some of them are, gonna, are, I think, will be very useful and relevant to the, to the kind of works, work that you are currently doing. And one of them is the first one, and this is a, the state health official letter, and Jean did mention this, this particular letter, we call it a show letter, um, and it is a letter um, describing the opportunities in Medicaid and CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, to address social determinants of, of, of health. And the purpose of this um, letter is to really, is to really um, describe the services and supports under the Medicaid pro program that can address um, social determinants of health. And they do fall into several categories of services, one of them being housing related supports and services, services. but they also include things like non-medical transportation, home delivered meals, educational services, employment, community integration, and social supports and case management. But this, the show letter does contain a section on um, housing related support. So, and it does give you um, um, 
pretty good descriptions of what housing related supports are under the Medicaid program. So if you are seeking more information about being able to better understand what can be covered under the Medicaid program in terms of housing related supports, I certainly encourage you to take a look at that, um, that document. Um, another document that you may find useful um, is the um, section 1017 report to Congress. Um, well, actually, let me go to the second bullet, um, the long-term services and support to rebalancing toolkit. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at that, um, at that toolkit um, because it does provide some very basic and understandable information around, um, uh, around the home and uh, around the home and community-based system. Um, it provides some really good contacts around HCBS and it provides a lot of examples of state strategies, state strategies um, around providing and strengthening their home and community-based system, which does include a lot, a lot of examples on um, kind of this intersection and partnering between health and housing and what states are, are really kind of doing in that space. Um, so, and definitely, you know, encourage you to take a look at that. The other one that I'll talk about real quickly, um, you may want to take a look at the Section 1017 report to Congress. It's a very lengthy report, but it's specifically on providing or looking at innovative state strategies around providing housing-related supports under the Medicaid program um, for individuals with an SUD who are experiencing homelessness. And what it does, it does highlight five state examples. So there's five case studies in that document or in that report. Um, they give you a very good flavor and idea of you know, how a state would implement housing related supports under Medicaid, specifically for individuals experiencing homelessness. And there's also a section in there on, on Medicaid authorities. If you're seeking more information on what, what the different Medicaid authorities are and how they can cover housing related supports for individuals who are experiencing homelessness, um, that may be a resource for you. Um, and then certainly encourage you to take a look at the other resources. There's a lot of resources under the Money Follows the Person program. Um, there are, there's a very um, um, excellent toolkit under the Medicaid Innovation Accelerated program um, that does provide a lot of information on building, developing housing um, partnership or partnerships between state Medicaid agencies um, and their housing counterparts or housing housing entities. So lots to look at and, and hopefully um, some of these resources will be um, relevant to your work and, and helpful in um, really helping to get people to access these emergency housing choice vouchers and get the services and supports they need to be in the community. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Martha. And we do have a lot of questions for CMS, but I think we'll wait until um, after we just share a couple of examples of some states as, as Jean and Martha have referenced. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and ask Ari to advance to the next slide. Great, so one state that um, we wanted to highlight uh, is Washington State. And so Washington uh, has implemented an array of pre-tenancy and tenancy sustaining supports through its foundational community supports program for high need Medicaid beneficiaries. And these services are covered by the state Medicaid program under their section 1115 demonstration. Um, and they began delivering these services in 2018. The primary goal of these services is to promote self-sufficiency and integration into the community and reduce potentially avoidable use of more intensive services by helping individuals with significant support needs obtain and maintain stable housing. To be eligible for these services in Washington state, individuals must meet age criteria, have a behavioral health treatment need or qualifying physical disability and meet at least one of a series of housing risk criteria that includes chronic homelessness. And in Washington state, an example of one community uh, where they have been able to pair housing with housing related supports would be Yakima Neighborhood Health Services, which is a federally qualified health center that also serves as a health care for homelessness provider and uh, is enrolled as a provider of supportive housing and supported employment under the FCS program. Um, and this 
program uh, at Yakima Neighborhood Health provides comprehensive integrated service delivery um, using case managers, outreach nurses, behavioral health service providers, housing specialists, employment specialists, and primary care providers. And they share an integrated electronic health record system to coordinate service delivery for, pro for program participants. And then they've engaged in a partnership with Yakima Housing Authority to provide supportive housing services as needed for recipients of all 74 of their allocated emergency housing vouchers. So that's a, a great um, example of where, um, you know, we're seeing connectivity between the housing resources and Medicaid related housing uh, support services. The next example, next slide, is in Maryland and in Maryland's Assistance and Community Integration Services Pilot. This is a service expansion initiative of Maryland's Medicaid 1115 Health Choice Demonstration. Um, and ACES provides a set of home and community-based services, those HCBS services, to a population that meets the needs-based criteria focused on high risk, high utilizing Medicaid enrollees who are at risk of institutional placement or homelessness post-release from certain settings. So pilots provide tenancy-based case management services, tenancy support services, and housing case management services. And through the ACES pilot, 600 spaces are available in total, with 420 currently allocated across four lead entities. So Baltimore City Mayor's Office of Homeless Services, Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services, Cecil County Health Department, and Prince George's County Health Department. And in Maryland, um, it, uh, the state requires that local governments come up with Medicaid match for their pilots. So pilots are managed locally by a lead local governmental entity. So in the example that we cited of those four, those are the entities and they're able to fund 50% of total costs with local dollars, provide leadership and coordinate with key community partners to implement the program. Now in Maryland of the 100 80 of 200 households that are being served with scattered site project based uh, of the 200 are being served with scattered site project based permanent housing vouchers. And in general, all Baltimore ACES clients come from the coordinated access system and are literally homeless. If they are determined high needs by the coordinated access systems vulnerability assessment, there's a secondary screen to determine if they're on Medicaid or if they're Medicaid eligible and meet the needs-based criteria for the ACES program. You can see here that uh, Baltimore's ACES pilot works with Baltimore Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, they're the service provider for the 200 households uh, where vouchers are committed. Um, and the city's hospitals provide Medicaid matching funds, that 50% that we talked about a moment ago. And um, as a COVID response, 20 high need older adults were served with rapid rehousing as a temporary alternative to congregate shelter. Um, services are provided through ACEs for those eligible and through rapid rehousing for those who are not. Um, and the 20 rapid rehousing clients that are served will be connected to permanent housing vouchers, many through the Baltimore Housing Authority EHV program. Okay, with that, um, before we move into questions, I'm just gonna sort of cover these next steps and then we'll, we'll have some time for Q&A. So next steps for PHAs and continuums of care and other housing stakeholders. So it's really important to learn how your state Medicaid agency plans to use their enhanced home and community-based service resources and whether housing related supports and services are part of their plans. Then clarify which agencies administer any new as well exist as existing funds at the local level. So are there behavioral health agencies, managed care organizations, community health centers that are administering these funds and 
you know, exploring those kinds of partnerships with those systems and outreaching them to engage them as necessary, informing them of the availability of housing vouchers for their target populations. Um, behavioral health agencies and community health centers, managed care organizations, they may not be um, as immediately versed in the available um, housing uh, related resources um, funded through HUD that your continuum of care PHA have um, that are available to some of their highest need, high risk um, patients. And so um, forging that partnership with them and letting them know that you do have access to these um, housing vouchers is really significant in helping to um, you know, build a coordinated collaborative partnership. Next slide, please. Offer to educate local partners about coordinated entry. They may not be familiar with coordinated entry. They may not understand it. And clarify the process for making referrals. So both making referrals from the behavioral health agencies or community health centers or MCOs to the PHAs um, and through continuum of care housing providers, as well as the other way. So PHAs and continuums of care being able to make referrals to those systems. Um, determine how PHAs will prioritize their target populations that may not be involved in coordinated entry and establish pathways to gain timely access to housing related supports and services for emergency housing voucher recipients. All right. We did want to do a couple of brief polls to just get a sense from you. Um, there are two, going to be two different polling questions. The first one is which of the following agencies who deliver Medicaid funded services are PHAs and continuums of care already partnering with? So if you can take a moment to um, pick which of these you're partnering with. And we'll just look for the results here in a moment. All right, so it looks like 33% of respondents are partnering with behavioral, behavioral health agencies, 27% with community health centers, and 23% with managed care organizations, um, and then 17% 17, 17 um, noted other. And feel free to put that other in the Q&A box, and we can look at that at another time. Um, and then, Ari, if we can bring up the next slide. This is a really important question for you all. What have been the greatest barriers to accessing needing, needed housing-related supports and services for Medicaid uh, individ enrolled individuals? I think this is this information will be really helpful for HUD and CMS as they um, are looking to communities to un, you know to uncover and, and discover um, what are the greatest barriers for public housing authorities and continuums of care. All right looking at the answers. So lack of funding for services. Um, today we've highlighted you know, some examples of how states, how public housing authorities and continuums of care might partner with um, uh, their Medicaid providers in their state um, to be able to bring services to bear um, to those housing uh, individuals accessing housing. Um, lack of provider capacity to deliver services individuals you serve don't meet eligibility criteria. I think this is um, an important, you know, we've got 10% of folks responding to that. Um, sometimes the eligibility criteria can be pretty confusing. I think we've seen a lot of questions about how do I find out what um, our state plan covers 
and who the service providers are that are offering those services. And so sometimes um, digging in and finding, discovering a little bit more information about who those partners are will help clarify if in fact people aren't eligible or if it's just that the eligibility criteria need to be clarified. Um, and then lack of information on where or how to make referrals. So we've got 31% of folks responding um, that that is the greatest barrier. And then 10% uh, individuals are not engaged or interested in receiving services. Um, again, I think here we, we sort of understand that as we offer more um, intensive um, and community-based services to people who are experiencing homelessness, that we may discover that people are more open to being engaged uh, into services. Um, and then we have 4% um, uh, who um, selected other. So we'll close that. Thank you all so much um, for taking the time to answer those poll questions. And with that, I think we're going to turn to questions now. And I will check in with um, my colleague, Alicia Woodsby here. Um, I know that we do have a couple of questions that I have flagged. And so let me go ahead and maybe ask these questions um, of CMS and HUD, um, and then we'll see what other questions that we have. So um, one question from an audience member asked if, um, uh, if a service provider can still partner with public housing authority and COCs to offer services if they missed the July 31st MOU deadline. Um, and HUD, would you like to um, answer that question? Hi, sorry, could you hear me? Um, you yes, hear me? we can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, so the MOU requirement deadline um, was um, passed, but that doesn't mean that um, the MOU that was agreed upon with, between the CH, the PHA and the COC cannot be amended. So uh, one thing that we've always stated is that the MOU is a living document. Um, and as the PHA and COC you know, mature the EHV program and identify um, and identify things such as um, additional services that you want to provide, um, this document can be amended. And, um, and um, I think there was also additional questions on whether we're collecting the MOU. Um, and so, yes, no, we are not collecting the MOU. So, although some PHAs and our COCs have provided um, the MOU to HUD, um, we've reached out um, to a couple PHAs um, um, from a technical assistance capacity to see if we can help, but we aren't collecting them. Um, and we encourage um, PHAs and COCs to always like uh, maintain accurate records and have the latest copy of their MOU on hand. Um, um, so the best place to go to find what's agreed upon between the PHA and COC is, um, is at um, the PHA or the COC. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost that last part of your sentence. Um, so HUD would not have um, the latest copy of the MOU. Right. But, um, okay. um, if, it's, if it has been amended an additional time before the requirement, of, um, before the requirement deadline, um, the most up-to-date MOU um, would be probably, uh, should be requested from the PHA and or the CSC. Okay, great, thank you. Another question we have um, is, and I think this is a question for CMS, where could public housing authorities and continuums of care find information about their state's optional benefits and the agencies offering these services? I'll, this is Jean, I'll take that one. And um, I mentioned uh, Medicaid.gov earlier, and I'm gonna put this in the, um, the it was the chat or the Q's and A's is that which is the best place but uh, on medicaid.gov there's a benefits section and there's a, a place that you can pick your state so um, I will put that out there and uh, it'll give um, again a very high level uh, indication of what the state um, uh, benefits are, are, are provided 
um, but uh, hopefully there'll be a resource for you to actually, you know, contact that the um, the state uh, or to access the state's website for additional information. Uh, one thing I, I also did didn't mention for the, for those who are, who are seeking to establish partnerships uh, within the state. Um, uh, CMS um, has a group, Medicaid and CHIP operations group, that really uh, has a great relationship with each state, um, uh, more so than uh, the, the folks on the phone from, from CMS um, uh, uh, today. Um, so I'd also invite you to, to reach out to the um, Medicaid and CHIP operations group. And again, I'll, I will look for that um, link and put it in uh, the chat in the appropriate uh, place. Uh, and then that person and all are, are very accessible people, uh, very happy to help make connections uh, for you um, and can uh, bring in the right people at the state because it can be a little bit overwhelming to identify um, uh, in some states the, the Medicaid agency who's the best point of contact to start developing partnerships. Um, so I think um, MCOG could, could be a, a great resource for you. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, another Sorry, question that, oh, go ahead, Martha. I think Jen, I mean, um, Jean mentioned it briefly, but I, I um, the only other thing that I would add on is certainly encourage folks to um, look at the state Medicaid websites, right? There's always generally a, a lot of information there and, and it may be a good idea to begin kind of, you know, wading through what is available to you on the, the actual states, their own Medicaid website. Great, thank you. Um, another question that's a little bit similar is, is there an easily accessible resource that shows which states are doing what services for social determinants of health? Okay, um, I'll, I'll start off. Um, uh, I, again, I think that um, uh, Medicaid.gov uh, website that, that has the, the benefits section um, would be a useful resource um, uh, to get that and also the um, matching that up with the um, state health officials letter that's that's uh, cited on the slide uh, would be, a, a, I think, a great um, and when worthwhile exercise uh, to match those two sources out uh, together. Right, and I would just add on, um, right now, yeah, Jean's right, the, the state um, health officials letter, it does include state examples. So you'll get a really nice flavor of what, um, what states are doing around social determinants of health under the Medicaid program. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna check in with Alicia to see, Alicia, are there other questions um, that have come through that we'd like to ask? Yeah, we did have another question for CMS. Um, it reads, for increased uh, ARPA F, map for uh, HCBS, a lot of acronyms there, <laughs> um, for Increased American Rescue Plan Act, um, uh, the federal matching assistance program dollars for home and community-based services. Wasn't the initial spending plan due in June from the state Medicaid agency? Are there any other benefits in this space for states who didn't apply by the deadline? I think that was for Jen. Hi everyone, this is Jen Bowden. Um, so yeah, I can answer that question. So um, we actually allow states um, to request a 30 day extension. A number of states did request that and all states at this point have submitted, all states plus DC, Washington DC have submitted spending plans. Uh, a number of those plans are actually um, still under review with CMS, um, but I would encourage states to look at um, the, the website of your state Medicaid agency, a number of states have posted their spending plans on their website and CMS will be uh, in the future um, posting summary information about what is included in state spending plans. Although we don't have that information available on Medicaid.gov just yet. Great, thank you, Jen. Alicia, other questions? We do have some questions related to some guidance or best practices around how to engage at a more local level, um, at a community level, um, some questions around um, ways to bring PHAs to the table and engage them in working collaboratively with Medicaid providers, and also in a scenario where there's multiple uh, managed care plans, you know, how do you uh, work with multiple managed care plans 
at, at one time and try to engage and coordinate with the housing system. Great question. Is there anyone from HUD who would like to take the first part of that question about how PHAs can um, engage? Uh, I'm sorry, Alicia, the first part of the question again was how they can engage with providers. How to bring, yeah, how to bring PHAs to the table. Um, yeah. To work collaboratively with the Medicaid providers, um, and it was just, that one was specifically for clients, you know, who may not be involved with coordinated entry. They were thinking of um, justice-involved clients. Mm -hmm. So one one practice that I've seen in some communities with regards to justice-involved individuals and PHAs is that, um, you know, working with a PHA, sitting down and having a discussion about the logistics of the level of service that's offered to an individual and ensuring that um, there will be um, supportive services staff that are um, available to work with an individual um, intensively if, if needed. Um, and you know, PHAs sometimes, um, as, as many of you know, feel like they, they haven't always been able to rely on service providers to respond when things go south, um, you know, particularly if something's happening in the middle of the night or on a weekend and they're not able to reach agency staff. Um, and so you know, I've actually you know, seen in some communities MOUs between um, service providers serving folks through reentry programming and PHAs um, that really outlines the uh, level of service that will be offered, the hours in which those services are available, the amount of time that will not be go gone over before somebody is able to respond. Um, but if other folks have any additional thoughts on this, I'd welcome them to chime in. Hi, this is Danielle. Hi, this is Danielle Garcia. I will say that um, that definitely is a challenge that we recognize. We have a working group in place where we are continuing our relationship and our collaboration with our partners over at HHS, hence the reason why we're you know, hosting this, this uh, wonderful webinar series for our clients, for PHAs and other constituents, just to really understand how to marry the two services when it comes to health and housing. So um, we are working um, actively to build that relationship at the local level and recognizing how important that is. But right now, I would say if you have, a, if anybody has questions, definitely contact your local um, housing Authority, you could even reach out to our local field office and we can try to bridge um, that gap between partnerships uh, with involving the local HHS at the state level. That's great. Thank you, Danielle. And I wonder if the same would be true of working with multiple managed care organizations. Um, if that's something that a local field office and um, perhaps the HUD continuum of care governing body can um, help facilitate uh, partnerships when there are more when there's more than one managed care organization. Or possibly um, our speakers from CMS may have some thoughts on that part of the question. It, it I didn't, may I didn't have anything okay. additional, um, Jen or Martha. Um, this, this is Martha. I mean, I, the one thing that kind of popped in my mind is, is um, you know, is, is if, um, you know, if you're seeking information around home and community-based services, you know, at, at a very in, individual level in the, in the community, um, or trying to identify providers in that space to, um, to reach out to your um, aging and disability resource centers, ADRCs, or your triple A's, your area agencies on aging. Um, and sometimes, or many of those organizations have um, what, what are called um, no wrong door systems where you can go there to get information on 
long-term services and supports and home and community-based services. Um, I don't know if that directly is really um, going to be, you know, facilitate or foster those partnerships that, that are needed, but certainly as a place to go to identify what kind of resources and potentially who are the providers that are providing some of those resources might be available to you through those networks. Great. Thank you, Martha. Another question we have is how does a person know if they are eligible for the Money Follows the Person program? I'll jump in a little quick. Well, so the Money Follows a Person pr program, um, there, are, there are some eligibility criteria for the program. Um, and one, there are, um, I'll start with that. There are 33 states in the District, District of Columbia that are participating in the program. And you can go on to the um, Medicaid.gov MFP website to identify the states that are participating in the program. And in order for an individual to be eligible for the program, they do have to be an individual who is um, residing in, in, a, um, in a medical institution, such as a skilled nursing facility um, for a, a minimum of, minimum of, of 60 days. And they do need to have um, um, you know, a, a level of a nursing home, we would call a, a, a level of care, nursing home level of care and be eligible for home and community-based services in the community. Uh, and um, they, um, through the MFP demonstration program, you know, there, there will be outreach support um, if somebody is in an institution and they do identify that they are interested in um, returning to the community, um, that's kind of where they would start, right? Um, and, and identifying that, that need in, inside an institution and, and make that determination on whether an individual is um, eligible for the MFP program. But those are some minimum criteria um, that, that are um, out there for MFP eligibility. Thank you. We have a question about uh, that asks, can presenters talk about the ideas for other routes for services for non-disabled homeless people needing tenancy supports if a state does not have, see, I'm sorry, my, my little um, screen here isn't really, Alicia, I'm gonna ask if you could finish reading that question. And you're on mute, thank you. Thank you. Sure, let me just scroll back up. Can presenters talk about ideas for other routes for services for non-disabled people experiencing homelessness that need tenancy supports? If a state doesn't have many of the optional services in their plan, approved plan, um, you know, what do they do? Um, this person's thinking specifically about like Medicaid covered peer services um, or any other um, form of outreach and home visitation. I could start off and then um, Martha or Jen can add to what I have to say on, on that. Um, so uh, individuals who are homeless could be Medicaid eligible. So I think the, the first step is um, providing assistance or uh, identifying an entity that really can help someone become Medicaid eligible. Um, one resource and, and then others on the phone may, may um, also suggest um, where that assistance may come from, but fed, federally qualified health centers many times have a great capacity for negotiating and uh, dealing with uh, eligibility um, uh, uh, concerns and issues. So that uh, homelessness should not be a barrier to accessing um, Medicaid eligibility. Um, uh, so um, that opens the door, of course, and then um, an, an individual um, uh, who has a, a, a need, medical, medical need that rises to the level of um, either the, the uh, uh, home and community-based services level of care um, for an institution would be able to qualify for um, the, uh, the state's 1915C waiver programs. I, I mentioned a, a wide range of services uh, that varies by states. Not all states have a, a comprehensive menu of services within the program. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, uh, but a, that level of care would be necessary. The 1915I program is a, the, the statewide, this um, state plan HCBS program. It's less stringent um, uh, level of, uh, uh, of care um, requirements. It doesn't actually have 
uh, facility level of care requirements, but there's other needs requirements. Um, so that's an, another possibility. Again, if a state furnishes 1915I state plan HCVS services. So that said, but again, if someone is Medicaid eligible and in um, states that uh, cover the adult group, there is a, a full range of, uh, uh, of Medicaid services. You'll, you, you notice the, uh, the list of mandatory services. Um, they'd be able to receive those, those services and um, uh, what, what is ever is in the, um, uh, the plan that the, the state offers for um, the adult group um, as well. Um, so, but others, um, Martha and Jen, would you have anything else to add? The only thing I, I would add is that um, states can, under Section 9817, with the, the additional 10% uh, uh, in the federal medical assistance percentage, that additional funding that they're getting, the states could use that money to um, expand the services that are available, as well as to cover um, additional services for additional populations. And so, you know, I would really encourage folks to reach out to their state Medicaid agency um, and, you know, talk to them about the things that they are, they think are important for the Medicaid, uh, for Medicaid beneficiaries or individuals who could potentially qualify for Medicaid. We are encouraging states very strongly to engage with stakeholders. Um, in terms of the types of activities that are in their plans. And, you know, as Martha mentioned, a lot of states are still in the planning phases. So I think there's, you know, lots of opportunities for states to make adjustments to what's in their plans, um, to add additional activities, to, um, you know, modify the things that they've requested. And so I think there's, you know, lots of opportunity for stakeholders to reach out to the states and to, to talk about what they think is important. Thank you so much, Jean and Jen. Alicia, I see that we have a little bit less than two minutes left. Are there any short final questions we'd like to ask of our panelists? Um, maybe as a last question, um, we did have one for CMS that was, um, just trying to scroll back down to it, related to respite. Um, why is this not letting me, just one second. Uh, can you speak to respite care for caregivers who are also IHSS providers for IHSS recipient living in the same? Well, but, uh, I think there's two questions with about re respite care, and for anyone who is has a family member with um, uh, uh, with dementia or a disability, um, can realize how important it is for family caregivers to have respite so that they're able to be strong to, to carry on with their family caregiving uh, roles. And respite care is available uh, for the caregivers um, uh, when someone, uh, for the individuals when they're enrolled in a um, uh, state plan or 1915C um, or, uh, waiver program. So that's really an important um, uh, option or, or service. Now, as far as the, the uh, as particulars related to IHSS, I'm really not familiar with, with the parameters of that, that uh, program. Uh, so I'd have to defer on that answer. All right, well, thank you. I, I thanks so much to our panelists today from CMS um, and, and to HUD for hosting this webinar. We are at time. Uh, we appreciate all the questions that have come in. And um, I know that the public housing agencies and COCs um, do have uh, know how to submit questions via um, the HUD um, AQ. So if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to submit them there. Reach out to your points of contact. Uh, and thanks everyone. We hope that you have um, a safe and um, productive rest of your week. Thank you so much. <laughs>